One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is! He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. The other day I was looking through a stack of old CDs, cleaning out my desk, and one of the CDs I found said JJ's Kick-Ass Mix. So I thought, oh, I should probably pop this in and see what see what's on there. And it was less than kick-ass according to current JJ's standards of what makes music quote-unquote kick-ass. There, there was a magic time when people would make mix tapes and you would write on the back of the mix tape, not the tape itself, but the little little flap that was inside the, the cassette tape container, and you'd write what tracks were on there. And people with neat handwriting would write that on the front of the disc when they started burning CDs. But I never had, I still don't have good handwriting. My handwriting looks like, during the writing process, I sneezed and the pen was really hot and I couldn't touch it for more than a th- few seconds at a time. And so this person was in pain. <laughs> it's always it's always a surprise to see what I've got on this CD. Would you like to know some of the tracks that yeah. I had? Lamb on us. Back to back versions of the night they drove old Dixie down. Um, which one- which red- iterations? So a Johnny Cash version okay. and another one that must have been by like a cow- old cowboy group because it was very twangy. Uh, the night they drove old Dixie down uh, that I don't remember at all. So hmm. maybe it was something that had been mislabeled. The only recording of that song that I ever listened to is from the last waltz soundtrack, which was the very final tour that the band mm-hmm. did before Robbie Robertson left and they reformed without him. And so they do a performance of that song because he wrote that song. Robbie Robertson, I believe, wrote that song. Mm-hmm. But it's it's lifted off. A lot of it's from like a Southern yeah. uh, rebel song or whatever. And and, and, I, and I honestly, I have no patience for people who miss the old South or like sort of uh, think of like, uh, oh, you know, this these Southern songs about Southerners losing. But that song I like listening to, not because of its... its uh, story that it tells but because of the passion it elicits it definitely is something where when i listen to it i appreciate the harmonies not necessarily the story elements of it which happens to me with a lot of different music where i appreciate the harmonies not necessarily the story elements i'm sorry what else was on your mix track so uh there was a song called pucka 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 squeedily boink (laughs) which is from a fraggle rock episode (laughs) um there were two real big fish ska tunes, Hooch, <laughs> and it polished off with Remix to Ignition. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Were you being ironic at the time or no? No. Okay. No. My, my mixtapes were just things I enjoyed listening to. At different times of the year, I listen to different music. There's stuff that reminds me of certain times just when I maybe got into it. Uh, remix to ignition is something I associate with summer and I associate it with late nights. Mm. So I enjoy that. Um, we've mentioned on previous podcasts that Britta Nelson and I have an affinity for country roads. Take me home by mm-hmm. John Denver. And it got me to thinking about C- CDRs were expensive for a little while. Yeah. And you're talking like three, four bucks a disc. And there must have been a time when cassette tapes were really expensive, too. So making a mixtape was a big deal. Making a mix CD was a big deal. But people won't know how big of a deal it is very soon when their music is all digital. And you can just switch back and forth to whatever you want. Yeah. I think the closest that someone will come to understanding is if you... 
if you can imagine somebody whose parents were extremely wealthy and owned a radio station and you had a direct line to the DJ and you could just tell that person what to play mm. over and over because you're the rich kid, you're the rich owner's son uh, or daughter, I guess. Those damn rich kids taking over the airwaves. It makes me appreciate a mixed CD. Have you ever found a random CD and you know you didn't make it? Yeah. Yep. Do you remember what was on it? Um, I they were from like uh, times I would try to make movies in high school, and I had friends that were musicians, and so sometimes they would make me stuff to use in in movies. I don't think anyone ever that I recall gave me a mixtape, but I have received CDs from people that just had their own contests on it. Oh, that's a bummer. No one made you a mixtape. I don't think I don't. Not that I can remember. I don't think anyone ever made me a mixtape. So you showed someone you loved them. Was no, making them a no mixtape. No one ever loved me. Apparently not. No. Um, I, <laughs> I think people miss mixtapes. Yeah. And it's weird that we never got to a point of making mix VHS tapes. Of like scenes? Yeah. Favorite scenes from Favorite things? scenes from movies. Maybe you've got the Royale with cheese scene from Pulp Fiction. An SNL sketch you really liked. Something uh, far and away when you where you can see, you no, know, it's all the right moves where you can see Tom Cruise's peen for a second. Oh, you can, huh? I think so, if memory serves. Hmm. So just a good collection, a mixed VHS <laughs> tape. Tom Cruise's peen. <laughs> That's a good band name. That's a good episode title. Let's think of other good <laughs> band names that are plays off of Tom Cruise. Um, all the right schmooves. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all the right schmooves. <laughs> um, the last Sammer guy. Oh, uh, Top Gunning. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> didn't Tom Cruise almost, almost move next to your lake cabin once? Yeah, he was going to buy a cabin three doors down from mine. And he, of course, he was never there looking at it, but his representation was. And I think they told somebody in the town, well, I'm looking for a very high profile client. I really can't say uh, who it is, but he was once married to Nicole Kidman. They're like, Keith Urban? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you probably saw him in the, the movie A Few Good Men. Holy shit, Jack Nicholson? <laughs> no. No, he's, he's that really famous guy. He's a member of the Church of Scientology. Oh, John Travolta. Oh, John Travolta. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, he played the part of Joel in uh, Risky Business. You're not talking about that kid who played Booger in the <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds movie, are you? He goes, it's Tom Cruise. This is a talking new, about Tom Cruise. This is a new character you're doing, or it's the character who can never guess Tom Cruise. Oh, God. <laughs> it's not that's a, that's a good character. never able to guess Tom Cruise. <laughs> but he has all this extensive movie knowledge. And he can name all these other people, but he can't ever get to Tom Cruise. Rosie O'Donnell pretended to be in love with him for years. Ted Danson. <laughs> um, whenever I have a uh, team name for something, I'm always the Danson Ted Dansons, mm. <laughs> because I think that that's funny. Is I mean, is it I'm funny? laughing at it. I think that's yeah. very funny. You might be just being nice to me. Do you drink tea? Time to time. What do you drink when you drink tea? Green tea, jasmine tea. So I get confused easily when it comes to tea. I'll say, could I get a cup of tea? And they'll be like, would you like Earl Grey, British breakfast? Mm, yeah. English See, morning. I think it's not British breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. And I panic and they'll be like, let me bring you the tea box. And they'll bring me a wooden box filled with teas. And I don't know what the heck I'm looking at. It's weird because a lot of those teas, <coughs> they're almost like coffee. They're so black and they're so dark. They're not coffee, but... It's like, why call this tea? I understand why you're not calling it coffee, but I think there should be something in between. But I can't stand it when I ask for tea at a restaurant and they only have one thing. Iced tea. Or or like uh, like uh, Earl Grey or something like that. Mm. Or British breakfast. Did they ever say like, oh, we only have iced tea, but I'll just warm it up in the microwave for you. I'm always hoping they're going to be coming out with like the humidor filled with a, a bunch of teas that they open in front of you and say, you could pick you could pick from this this variety. And if there's a pomegranate or a blueberry, I'll go for it. We, as a people and society, are pretty bad when it comes to choices sometimes. Yeah. 
People get overwhelmed with choices and they start to panic. And that's why this Coke freeform machine is the worst thing that we've been given an option with lately. Can you describe what you're Coke freeform? Coke freeform are the Coke machines that have a single spigot and oh. the touchscreen. And you can have Diet Coke or you can have Diet Coke mixed with cherry Coke or Diet Coke with the uh, Fanta and all this. You've got hundreds of choices. That's right, because we flavors. we ran into that when we were at Hamburger Royalty today. That's right, Hamburger Royalty. Don't be confused with uh, bovine royalty. No, different uh, different places. And I've been to a few restaurants that offer one of these machines. And so when someone says, uh, "Can I get a Diet Coke?" and they're like, "Well, would you like any flavoring?" What? Excuse me. Well, we have Coke free form, so you you can add flavoring. Well, what kind of flavoring? And then the server. Oh. But they asked for it, right? They offered. Why don't offer people things? That's the what we don't, have to come to. Stop offer, offering people things. Don't offer people things. When if some, businesses could just get one thing right, it's to stop giving options to customers. When you walk into a bank and you're like, I'd like to open a savings account. Don't give me seven options and make me think, did I make the right option? Should I have, should I have done this money market account? Or should I have done traditional savings? Or holy shit. Am I missing out on something else? Just stop. Stop. Just stop. Stop giving me choices. One and done. Um, there. When I walk into a business that has, back in the day, McDonald's, right? You walked in there and your choices were a hamburger, a cheeseburger, french fries, no size, just french fries, mm-hmm. and a malt or a shake. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. And so you didn't have people going there. Oh, let's see. Um, mm, what am I gonna order? Let's see. Um, gosh, it's done. If there's something that grinds JJ's gears, <laughs> it's too many options, and it's people who are spending all this time on their smartphone or chatting with a loved one, and then they get to the front of a line and they don't know how to make a decision. I guess I know what your next strongly worded letter is going to be about. I just don't know to choices whom yet. To society, <laughs> to all, dear all business, less choices. And here's the option. If you don't offer something that I want, I'm just not going to patronize your business. And that's fine. That is fine. Because if you're a place, Hardee's, this is a good, not to get into fast food again, but <laughs> Hardee's had a problem in the mid to late nineties. They were trying to be the everything restaurant. You could get, a sourdough bun. Uh, you could get fried chicken. A, a fried chicken. You could get soup at Hardee's. What do you think happened with the fried chicken? Were they like, listen, we've tried to go toe to toe with McDonald's and Burger King, and it's not doing great. But maybe what we can do is just get a toehold with a different competitor, and and we'll well because they went after KFC hard yeah. in those commercials. And I remember as a kid watching those and telling my mom that I found them upsetting because I thought they were being too mean to KFC. <laughs> Poor Colonel. But I mean, did it really win anyone over? I don't ever remember getting chicken. Obviously not because yeah. they don't still carry it. Do you know what kind of major retrofit they would have to do to include chicken with their fryers? Mm. It must have been nuts. And for them to give up that ghost at one point. Yeah. Too many options. Yeah. If a family really needs cheeseburgers and chicken for dinner, they will make two stops. <laughs> or just tell them you don't get to get everything that you want. You pick one or the other and then you be happy with it. We're so lucky. We're so lucky we have the choice to choose between burgers or chicken. I remember you used to be the master of the combo dinner. Like oh, yeah. you'd go to one place, get one thing, go to another place, get another thing. Maybe a third place for a third item if it was a three item meal. And then that would be the meal. For example, Arby's curly fries. Oh, yes. Arby's curly fries. Agreed. Yep. Burger King burgers. Yep. Taco Bell, taco pizza. And oh. those things together would make a perfect meal. I don't know if I ever had a Taco Bell taco pizza. I would also go because I love the Colonel's crispy strips at KFC and I love their mashed potatoes and gravy. But then I'd be like, I want macaroni and cheese. And KFC never satisfied my macaroni and cheese needs. Um, and so I would get mac and cheese from a restaurant that I like. Just like, the, I'd like to order off the kids menu, please, uh, to go <laughs> curbside if possible. Even that. Oh, here's another too many choices. 
When I order out from a restaurant, I have too many choices for how I'm going to pick up that food. Okay, uh, let's see. You're going to be stopping in. Your order's going to be ready in 20 minutes. And will you be using our car side to go service? Or will you be coming into the restaurant? Or would you uh, like us to give it to a patron who's leaving who might live near you? <laughs> no, I just one thing. I got to come in, make me interact with a human being. Don't places with car side to go. You're hurting your employees because none of them want to put on a jacket to come out and deliver the food to my window because it's only going to take them five seconds. But they're doing it over and over. That's why your pneumonia cases are spiking <laughs> is because they're like, I'm just going to be out for a second. Well, it's 20 below zero. It's directly related to car side to go. <laughs> Applebee's has had a huge spike <laughs> in pneumonia cases. That's why there's a work shortage. That probably is why. I think I'm going to do something safer, like work on a fishing barge next year. Why not give them a nice coat? And they shouldn't have to use their personal coat. It, they would. I bet they would just be like uh, when you have to pay for like your uh, work shirt. I bet it's like, yeah, you got to buy a work coat, too. It's got to be Applebee's branded. It's got to be in the local school colors. So then maybe you don't buy it. Maybe that's what they're saying is I don't want to spend twenty dollars oh, sure. for a piece of branded clothing that if I f- get fired or quit is going to be useless. To that's me. true. That's true. Do you hand in, hand in your name? T- have you ever worked anywhere where you're required to have a name tag? Yeah. Do they let you put Tucker on it? Yeah. So it was. It's always said Tucker. I think. Did you sign your work as a kid, Tucker? When you say sign my work, like as a like when you turned in, in a school? report as yeah. Tucker, yeah, because they knew I was technically I was legally Tucker for a period of time, right? Until I turned eighteen, I changed it back then to William. But yeah, I mean, I they knew I I was in the school system as Tucker. I've always gone by that. So is that what your diploma says? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I haven't looked at my high school diploma since high school. Did so. it ruin you the fact that, like when kids were playing like? Banana, fana, fo, fama, me, my, mo, man. Well, that came up in a in my second grade class with mm. Mrs. Mund. Where that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're not familiar, it would go like this. Let's say my name was Ray. They would go Ray, Ray, Bo, Bay, Banana, fana, fo, fe, me, my, mo, me, Ray. <laughs> but if it was Tucker, it'd be Tucker, Tucker, Bo, Bucker, Banana, fana, fo. Oh. Mm. No. Yeah, pretty much. Although I, I know I liked being, I, I've, I've liked going by Tucker. I've met maybe four other Tuckers in my life, and almost every one of them was a golden retriever. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, I don't run into them very often. There used to be a Facebook group called How Many Fuckers Named Tucker on Facebook, and I was a part of that, but I don't think that group exists anymore. So what part of speech is it if you're like a dog walker? What is Walker? Is that an an adjective? I think so. Or is it a verb? It's what you are, right? Yeah. Walking would be the verb if you are right. a walker. So then it's an adjective. It describes what you are. Uh, or or, or you're, an, what you're doing. Or is it a noun? Mm. A walker is a thing. Well. Person, place, or thing. A person who tucks is a tucker. <laughs> That's not my name is not an adjective. My nickname is not an adjective, but that's not a noun, though, is it? I, yeah, it's it's a noun. I think it's a pronoun, right? Yeah, is that what it is. Isn't that what names are? Boy, so that's not what you that's not where your name uh, comes from. Is that the English. action to tuck? No, we have not had an English lit major on the podcast <laughs> yet, which is obvious <laughs> from this. And um, the other day I met a JJ for the first time ever. And it caused a problem because I was coordinating something through work and a homeowner who we were interacting with was coordinating something with someone she knows whose name is JJ. Uh, And so my messy, my friend uh, and coworker went up and said, Oh, I'm, uh, I talked to JJ about this. And she says, Oh, you talked to JJ too. Yep. Okay. So then we're set. Yep. Okay, because JJ told me this, and never using a he or she, which instantly would have fixed the situation. And it went on for long enough where they both thought everything was said and good to go, but they were talking to two independent people. (laughs) And that's never happened to me before. And it probably never happens to you because you've got a name like Tucker. Never happened to me. But if you are, oh, let's say uh, uh, Miranda, 
uh-huh. bet you Miranda's had that happen to her before. <laughs> Sorry, Miranda. Bummer. <laughs> so everyone's <laughs> getting read your rights all the time. So, speaking of girls' names that end with <laughs> I was a, wondering. It was like, I don't even know whose podca- yeah. which podcast this no, one's going to be. Girls' names that end with A. I found a way to tie it all together. <laughs> uh, Sabrina Horning is our uh, guest today. The Alabaster Disaster herself. The Alabaster Disaster. Uh, I'm excited to have Sabrina on. Sabrina and I met many years ago. You get to hear the backstory of that. She's had fun adventures with Tucker and myself. Uh, we spend a lot of this podcast teasing you with stories, one of them that we don't even end up getting back to. <laughs> You'll have to listen to find out which one we don't circle back to, but I promise we'll make good on a future podcast. Yeah, Sabrina is an incredibly uh, fun young woman who has done a lot. And sometimes I think I-, I wish I'd accomplished as much as Sabrina has at this point. If you have lived if you've spent any amount of time in the Fargo Moorhead area, you probably know who Sabrina is. Mm-hmm. Um, because she's at like almost every downtown event from one way or another. She was one of the founders of Bad Weather Burlesque. Her art is everywhere. She's been a model. She she's been she, involved with the High Plains Reader. Absolutely absolutely still is. And so she's everywhere. So more than likely Sabrina might be the most locally famous person we've had on the show. Well, thank you very much for that, Tucker. You're welcome. I consider myself pretty locally famous. Uh, but I didn't say you weren't. That's fine. Also, <laughs> shout out to Troy, who listens to the podcast and told me how much he enjoyed it the other day. That was a real treat for me. Uh, when he said that I like your podcast, my immediate reaction was, you want to be a guest on it? <laughs> and uh, you're going to listen to future podcasts because I'm going to convince Tucker to have a contest where... We will, anybody can be a guest do and it. we'll pick one random person to be a guest on the podcast. Let's do it. And invite you into Tucker's personal living space, aka oh, the hopefully, studio. Hopefully we'll have a, our new studio by then. Even if we do, we're coming back to your living space for it. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, strap in because this is a podcast featuring uh, Sabrina Horning. JJ Meets World. Sabrina, welcome to JJ Meets World. Feels good to be here. Does it? Does it really? <laughs> it really does. You're the first person to say that. Oh, I don't believe that for a second. It's true. Everyone <laughs> else sort of gives me this uncomfortable look, and then usually they wink at me. So I also appreciate you not winking and making this uncomfortable from the get go. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, we know each other from the Fargo Theater. We sure do. And there is a special brand of person who worked at the Fargo Theater. Um, How many times when you were working there did somebody wander in and say, gosh, I worked here in in 1972, or I did some of the remodeling work during the renovation? Didn't it constantly seem like a revolving door of people who are connected to that space? There's definitely a certain kind of magic there. It does take a certain type of person. It takes a certain level of passion, too. It's, It's very... It's very Fargo in that sense, I guess. You know, That's it's the name. It's the iconic spot. If people are from out of town and someone says, "Oh, I want to see what Fargo is," well, go look at the Fargo Theater. The uh, Fargo is in its name. It's an easy way to get that uh, Facebook or that Instagram shot. You really need London, Paris, Fargo. Yeah, that poster <laughs> was for sale there. <laughs> uh, how many how many years did you work at the Fargo? I was there for about four years. Wow. I should have went to college that long. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you got a degree in popcorn uh physics. I did, you know, and I did gain a pretty good amount of film knowledge too from being around a bunch of film buffs and oh, students good. Good. and staff. I gained a lot of weight from unlimited Pepsi and popcorn. That's what I gained from my time at Fargo <laughs> Theater, um, as I think a lot of other people did. One thing I thought that was really cool is the Fargo Theater is a great place for weirdos to congregate, and the even weirder weirdos work there. <laughs> um, it was sort of the small haven for people who didn't, you know, who could never work at the Gap. Right, and that's what was really cool about it. And I, I started working there because Tucker was working there and I had been at a very successful um, video store that is now closed. <laughs> uh, coincidentally, a couple years after I got fired, I 
connected? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I'm not going to start a rumor. Yeah, you you tell leaving the video rental market is what really gutted it. You know, it, I saw the writing on the wall, though, because it's this, this Netflix thing is pretty legit, you guys. It's really catching on. And if anyone ever figures out how to stream, boom. I don't know, uh, man. I don't trust the Internet. Just in general? do you? Is that for reals? Halfway. Oh, do tell. I mean, I don't know. I guess... I don't like investing all of ice my ice cream cone it. Ice cream cone it. Ice cream cone it. Yeah. Okay. So I don't uh I don't like putting all of I mean like I put a lot of information on there. I put like my photos and like and all that and maybe like random thoughts. But I I don't know. I mean like especially like trusting like I spend a lot of time on remote gravel roads and like I don't really know how to use my GPS and I don't my my internet doesn't always use or work on my phone, so I have to have a map. I'm one of those people. Like I, I don't know. You prefer having something physical in front of you that doesn't require a Wi-Fi connection. And yeah, it's a, it works a lot better for my lifestyle. <laughs> we, I, I don't think that you are, uh, you're, I don't think that you're crazy for thinking that, Sabrina, because mm-hmm. as technology keeps progressing, there are people who want to trust something that can't be hacked. So right. no one will ever be able to hack a piece of paper and a pen where you write down uh, you know, your bank account number on it. Right. Someone has to break into your home and find that and understand what it is and steal it. Versus if I put that in the notes section of my iPhone, there are actively thousands of people across the planet trying to get that information. So... I I full on believe that there's a trust factor, and I also like a good atlas. <laughs> right. Uh, it's also interesting because a lot of people will say, "Oh, I've got to get the brand new atlas this year." I like using an atlas from 1985, 86. <laughs> yeah, there you <laughs> go. One where that might be wrong now. Yep. Because <laughs> you know, it's an adventure. When we worked at the theater, I remember too. Like at least probably once a week, I would see some dude walk in from downtown and see Sabrina behind the counter and then be like, Hey, Hey, how's it going? My, my, my name's Tom. And, uh, Hey, can I get your number? You know, like <laughs> that would happen. And so I'm sure just having the internet, then those dudes don't need to even come into the Fargo theater now to ask you that question. They can just track you down however they want. Yeah, they that's they just send me crazy. random dick pics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you through the window, and they're like, "Okay, well, <laughs> the process of elimination. I'm gonna find out who that girl is." And do you remember when people used to come in and think that it was a porn theater? Oh yeah, absolutely. And then they would be like, "So are you in any of the movies?" Yep, I remember that. <laughs> you were that particular there. guy because watching. So Sabrina is Sabrina can have a conversation with anybody. It she's is amazing. She's someone who's just like really approachable and like any. And I've seen her hang out with all kinds of people <laughs> for like the whole spectrum. So. She's very friendly and approachable, but I that means then that sometimes she gets into uh, an awkward conversation where that sort of social contract comes in where you're not going to end it right away, but the other person is really awkward. And I don't know why. I would just feed off of seeing those situations happen. You just uh, like to see me squirm. It, it wasn't that. It was more like I was the one who was squirming because it looked so uncomfortable and it made me laugh. I I don't know. I don't know. But that was a particularly weird one. Um, where that gentleman, I think, was looking for the Northern, which was a few blocks west. That's not a porn right. theater either. No, right. no. He needs the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're thinking of Google, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that would be one reason to trust the internet for the porn content. You're like, you need to go to the store that's across from the bus depot. That's what you're looking for, <laughs> sir. That's where you that's where you can be. The three of us so, had a lot of fun. The, act. the three of us had a lot of fun at the Fargo Theater, though. We had a really great oh. crew. Of yeah, we people, did. the black black hoodie crew, like uh, Jonas. That's who I wanted to Jonas bring up first. <laughs> oh, Jonas, if you're out there, buddy, and listening, we love you so much. I miss him. I miss so Jonas much. so much. Jonas uh, told Sabrina a story one time that the second I walked through the door, she's like, "JJ, I got, I got to tell you the story that Jonas told me <laughs> about reading Archie comics." <laughs> Do you remember that story? <laughs> yes. Would you be willing to tell that story? Because it's just wonderful. Well, you know, and we did have a, (laughs) 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 but, uh, 
oh, about yeah, he's a big fan of Archie comics and reading him in the and taking a bubble bath. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> and Jonas came in from Western North Dakota and he worked out in the oil fields for years, you know. So he and he lived on a, you know, he, you know, was raised on a farm. So he was just, you know, and he was kind of a a muscular, like Yeah. Good looking dude, you know. He's like, yeah, I just like to read Archie comics in the bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were a few times that we would uh we would have some cocktails and then we would end up like I think I even wound up borrowing a pair of his shorts and we we're both <laughs> sitting in his apartment in his bathtub reading Archie comics. <laughs> yeah, that was his jam and it was if he never talked about reading Archie comics on the bus or Taking them to the park. He only seemed to like to read Archie comics in his bathroom. <laughs> that was like his thing. He also wore clogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because he is really like he's fluent in Icelandic and what else? Norwegian. Norwegian as well. He lived well. in the Faroe Islands. He's yeah. probably like one of the most interesting. We have and- to get Jonas on this podcast. We really yeah, do. we do. Uh, Sam. Oh, one, Sammy. Of the, yeah. one, of, oh, <laughs> one of the greatest visual artists I've ever met in my life. But uh, he was the head projectionist when I worked there, when we all worked there. And Sam was great. Sarah Watson Curry just remember? had a baby. Oh. Yeah, she did. Do you remember? Back to Sam. Do you remember when we uh, when we were all on MySpace and you could do those MySpace bulletins and yeah. then he made a MySpace bulletin that he barfed on the marquee? <laughs> 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 and then Prairie came out and she's like, so... Sam just posted that he barfed on the marquee. It's like, I don't really know what to do about that. <laughs> Prairie was our boss, by the way. The first time I met Sam was um, one of the other projectionists at the Fargo Theater had accidentally unspooled an entire Bollywood film onto the floor of the projection booth. And Bollywood films are like four hours long. So we're talking like a lot, a lot of film. If and you've never only- worked with, um, we're talking about miles, oh, miles and miles of celluloid film. And all just sitting in a big pile <laughs> on the floor. And so Sam and I would go through it. And if we realized that a knot was too much, we'd have to like splice the film and undo it and tape it back together. <laughs> so I spent two days with Sam on like fixing this body, which we hope got back to what it needed to be. And we sent it back out. That, that took forever. But there's only like a couple of those in the country too, right? So they're like super rare on top of that. Yeah. yeah. So there's that pressure too. Yeah. New film prints aren't really being made for the most part anymore. I don't believe anybody is printing actual celluloid anymore. I know Did- Kodak tried to uh, to do it again, but uh, Quentin Tarantino has a private company that will right. do 70 millimeter, but it's so much cheaper for studios to just send out a hard drive or to i mean there's even like a streaming aspect to certain stuff and we we got to be at the end of an era it was like being uh it was like being there the last days of the the pony express (laughs) uh and the fargo theater was unique because it was an art house cinema and live events started to become a big thing during the time we were there right do you remember david allen co yeah <laughs> oh man oh <laughs> that was one of my favorite nights uh i liked the ace freely night where he was violently ill mm-hmm. but he still signed your record for you yes what a dude. He's still my favorite Kiss memory. <laughs> I remember when Kenny G came and I realized he was three feet tall. Oh, yeah? And yeah. the G stands for Gorlick. Gorlick? Yeah, didn't we look that up? Or is that maybe that was Sabin and I? <laughs> Sabin, <laughs> which is not a town, but a person well, in, this, in this situation. It's technically both. In this situation. Um, <laughs> Willie Block. Um, who else was there at that crew? Kelsey Meyer was there towards the end. Who was the... Why can't I remember her name? What, who was the girl who built the... Pinata that looked like me Steph. from my last night. Steph, <laughs> Steph and Brian. Yeah, and then she filled it with I thought candy, but until we cracked that thing open, it was full of mustard packets <laughs> <laughs> for my hatred of mustard. <laughs> that was clever. That was well done. It was well done. Um, so many great people who came through. The, how how have we not talked about baggies yet? Good old Dave <laughs> Ranow. Baggies and Pam. We're gonna have to get into Baggies. Now. Yeah, we'll have to tell. We'll have to get Baggies to tell the story why we call him Baggies. Oh, we'll tell it. We'll tell it here. Oh, we want to tell it right Absolutely. here. Absolutely. So, 
This would really, you like? Would you like me to talk to Sabrina while you keep moving to go back? And I want to get more coffee, but you're talking about baggies and Pam, which I love. <laughs> but yes, I'll go get coffee and then we'll talk about baggies and Pam. All right. So, Sabrina, in the years since you have been gone from the Fargo Theater, you've been pretty active, doing a lot of pretty neat stuff. I've been all over the spectrum. Yeah. So, what do you consider? Do you consider yourself an artist? Yeah. But what? type of do you do you have a genre you like to work in do you what what do you consider because photography was something i know yeah. that captured your imagination um i see a lot of work that you do with german heritage and culture yeah i've been doing a lot of folk art stuff i uh, i actually just finished up um tardily filling up out my uh grant final grant report from the um, the folk art and traditional art apprenticeship program. I was studying under um, Piper Bloomquist in Grand Forks to learn rose mauling. So, and so what's rose mauling? If people so have never heard of it, it's traditional Norwegian folk painting. So, um, yeah, lots of scroll work, lots of floral imagery. So that was that was really interesting. And before that, I um, I got a grant to learn Scherenschnitt and Wichenanke, which is German and Polish paper cutting. And I've been like rambling all over the place, like. Well, showing my work and then also teaching people how to do it, because that's kind of part of the grant is going out and, you know, spreading the good word so it doesn't become forgotten. Sure. And it's it's really interesting because there's a lot of people like folk art reaches so many different people like it captivates not, you know, people our age. But then there's also um, the older generation. Like when I, when I told my grandma that I got that grant, she called her friend in, in Arkansas, who's also German. And, you know, the two of them were about ready to start crying because that was something that their mothers knew. And then, you know, like, uh, you know, I shouldn't contemporary Germans, that's, yeah. or Germans these days, you know, they it, that's something that they don't really participate in that or much the anymore. Modern German. Or the modern German. <laughs> well, and it's keeping that history alive. And I Definitely. think there's something that's deeply respectful and deeply uh, personal to people who when a younger generation can embrace and want to learn and carry those things on, uh, we're, we live in a throwaway culture now, let's face this it. It's true. And so we're throwing away not only items like I split a seam in my pants yesterday and rather than taking them to a seamstress, I was like, nope, these things were five bucks. So long, pants. <laughs> uh, but we also are throwing away our heritage and our culture and some of our you know, style of art. So it's really neat that you've embraced this so much though, that you're like, uh, I'm not only going to learn it, I'm going to spread it. Oh, to, you know, and then God, and it's just, it's infectious because I, I, I do that. And then I also go around and go to these small towns and collect all these stories too. Cause I had this great idea that I was going to write this, this book of ghosts. Well, I was going to write this book of ghost stories and I couldn't make my deadline because I have to have my fingers and, and too many different pots mm. but pots or pies <laughs> both okay yeah, yeah. pots and pies hot pies that's I like put pot my pies. fingers in a pot full of pie <laughs> mm, pot yeah full of right pie. Since, you, since you've been all over north dakota i mean is there sort of if you could tell someone about one hidden gem in this state oh. that you've been to can it, can we say you say think about it but i think at, we're gonna do this this has become a JJ Meets World sure. staple where we count to three and say something at the same time. I don't have one, but I got to think of one. Knowing some, I think I might be able to say something that Sabrina may say. Okay. I okay. think I know what That's you're going to say. So on the count of three, one, two, three. Yipsalani. Yeah! <laughs> it's the first time it's worked. The first time. <laughs> that, uh, I used to love hearing stories of your adventures down in good old Yips. Yipsy. Well, spe spell Yipsilani for people. <laughs> Yipsilani. Y P S I L A N T I. Mm -hmm. Yipsilani. And what happens in Yipsilani that's so special? Well, you know, what happens in Yipsilani stays in Yipsilani. <laughs> 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 well, it's a it's a little it's a tiny little town southeast of Jamestown, and it's about there's maybe less than a hundred people out there. And uh it's nestled in this little valley and you can, you find it. If, it's one of those gems that you find it if you're looking for it, you know, it takes some doing to just kind of stumble across it. But yeah, there's not a lot of signs that say 20 miles to Ypsilanti. Right. Uh, and 
the the stories that Sabrina used to tell me were the those magical stories that you only hear from rural America. Like, oh, this last weekend, uh, this is this is the activity that we all engaged in out there. And I'm like, that sounds friggin' awesome. And you can only do it in a town where there's a county sheriff and you know that he's out of town or out of the county for the weekend. So like, <laughs> let's do something that's gonna be very, very illegal. So not fun. Rutland. Not Rutland, no. <laughs> Every time Tucker joined me in uh, Sargent County, Rutland, North Dakota specifically, uh, tragedy would befall him. <laughs> Every time. Every time. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, not a place where I want to go back. Although the the uh, statute of limitations is over, so that's right. he can't do anything to me now. He also got in big trouble like he, but, a couple of years ago in Moorhead. I think you I guys think are holding out on a good story here. Sheriff Travis Paper of mm-hmm. Sargent County was in the forum Sergeant was Travis in the news <laughs> pretty recently yeah for getting into like a bar fight but i think the woman who he fought with might have been more culpable after the fact because she struck the first blow but he was still yeah bothering what, them what, and- oh, I, I, do, I don't think it was a matter of uh, he said she said what i think the story has weight in is this when the moorhead police department confronted him about it and showed up he was like I'm a cop. You wouldn't do, you don't do this to other cops. Mm. Like cops, let cops slide. Yeah. And that to me was the like, Oh yeah. JJ, Mm. JJ and Jared Nillis are our good buddy. uh, Were, they were doing a summer theater program out there for the kids in the area because it like, was in between baseball, but before school started, they yeah. had like a three week gap. Yeah. They had a three <laughs> week gap. They had, they needed something to do. And actually this was the best thing that, that the best time those kids ever had. They loved working oh, with JJ and Jared. 30 kids. It was so much fun. But so much fun. It was like one year after I had graduated high school, I want to say. And I still hadn't gotten it in my head that you need to change the oil in your car. I ever. forget that too. Sometimes. Ever, right. So I had this car that I had two days prior spray painted to look like the Joker mobile. So it was bright purple with bright green hubcaps. And then JJ calls me and says, hey, we need some help shooting a video. Do you want to come help us? Sure. So I drive to Rutland the next morning with my car full of stuff because I was moving between apartments. Engine dies because I'm like I'm like 20 minutes instead of Rutland at this point. Engine dies. I don't know what's up with it. A hitchhike into town meet up with JJ and our friends, and then we find out that my car had been towed before I could get someone to it, um, that the sheriff had gone and found it. And what had happened was, was paper or someone had come up on the car and just looked in, like, like went through the back and found, I had a sword cane sitting in the back that my grandmother had given me as a, just a kitschy gift one time and it was just sitting in the bottom of my car and plus if you're Kid. driving a joker mobile you kind of have to have a sword cane yeah right. well, there were like yeah. two or three actually in there yeah kids if you have sword canes in the back of your car you should apply at the fargo theater those are the type of weirdos <laughs> yeah. that congregate yeah. there i no longer own a sword cane i just what? like to I, this was the last time i owned a sword cane and and it's important you note that because they confiscated this they confiscated them and uh they would not let me have them back. He would not let me have them back because it was against the the sen- the North Dakota Century Code is what he said that I was in possession of them because they were technically concealed dangerous weapons. They were knives over a certain blade length. Mm. And J- JJ and I went to the police uh, department there to they said I could have one of them back. And he told me that it was I, I could have this sword back because it wasn't worth anything were the words that he used with me on the phone when we spoke we never met in person um but we had some words on the phone and then um he basically threatened he was like you know i don't have to bring you in but i can bring you in on this like i can do something to you and i threatened legal action and then we got the phone and then i never spoke of it again with him or any lawyer or anything like that but then he would pull over like our friends and ask them if they were me because he'd never seen me. He had no idea what I looked like. That's was, really bizarre. It was weird. Um, and then I, I had heard through a third person. Don't even know if it's true, but I bet it is. They ended up getting auctioned off in some like, you know, police auctioning off things that they've um, taken from people. And uh, yeah, that's that was the last time I was in Rutland. Man, I wouldn't go back either. I don't blame you. Yeah. 
But, we also eh. made a very angsty music video during oh, that yeah. same trip. To a Radiohead song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. JJ plays someone struggling with a weight condition. <laughs> yep. And uh, Jared plays somebody who someone thinks who's he's... Someone who's autistic. Yep. And uh, Jake, Jake was sad because of a failed relationship. Yeah, since he ended up really hurting his shoulder because Tucker had him like just thrashing and like throwing his fists out in the air. And I think he pulled like his shoulder I out of whack. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so good times. Good good <laughs> good times. Anyway, Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti. <laughs> it's a good it's a good place to be from. It's a great place to visit. Man, you know, I actually tried to move back out there again. Like every time I try to move out there, it's one of those tragic situations where I just <laughs> So my dad's my dad's farm out there, right? Um, he hadn't had water out there for probably about seven years, and there was this guy that was living out there. It was also it was also the same guy that was complimenting Will's hair. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Willie's hair. Yeah, we uh, we had a, a fateful Christmas party out there <laughs> at Buffalo you're, Bob's you're, house. You're really halting your speech. I just shared my Travis paper story. I know, but <laughs> don't hold out on us, Sabrina. <laughs> I mean, at some point we'll have Willie as a guest. So. <laughs> Maybe we can save that story <laughs> for him. Things. We haven't talked about Baggies and Pam no, yet. No, in fact, this Ooh. whole podcast is all about like, well, just wait for the next episode because it's one <laughs> giant tease is what it is uh, for what's coming up. I'm a big fan of the tease. What can I say? Yeah. So uh, here, let's four questions right off the bat for you, okay. Sabrina. Number one. So you did some bartending at Sturgis one year, right? I did. Yeah. So tell me about that experience. I got the worst sunburn of my life there. Really? Yeah. We... Uh, So, uh, every, you know, I made some good money. It was the first time I ever bartended too. So like if there's any, I guess I'm, I'm kind of the person that dives head first into things, you know, I was like, I've never had bartending experience. Why don't I just bartend at Sturgis? That's a great idea. (laughs) Well, it's not stressful at all. Those folks aren't (laughs) looking for cosmopolitans or Harvey Wallbangers. They're looking (laughs) for, you know, Jack and Coke or beer. Right. Yeah, totally. I was hired on as a beer bath girl, so I was just supposed to like open beers and hand them, take people's money, you know. Repeat. I'll take a glass of milk in a dirty glass. <laughs> <laughs> Name that movie. <laughs> uh, is it Pee Wee's Big Adventure? It's cop and a half. Mm. And he's they're at they're at like a bar, and he says, yeah. "I'll take a milk," and then the whole bar stops and this little kid goes in a dirty glass did you know that there is a sequel to cop and a half that came out you know in the mid 20 teens is it cop and two thirds i don't think so i think it's cop and a half two which would technically be cop and a cop yeah (laughs) Uh, actually or it should just be like uh, cop and one i believe i think i think like Jeff the Cable Guy, Larry the Cable Guy, is in it. Jeff the Cable Guy, yeah, yeah. that's his brother. <laughs> the lesser known of the Cable Twins. Um, so okay, so bartending at Sturgis was, uh, I, I'm sure, a wild experience. How did you yeah. get this sunburn? Were you outside? I was. So obviously, every... that's how you get sunburns. So, well, Dumb you know, question. were you outside? <laughs> I was outside. We had to have a mandatory bike wash, right? So like a bunch of us girls were out there in our bikinis washing off these motorcycles that are worth more than a lot. I mean, like it was just like, you know, there's some really beautiful machines. So that was kind of stressful, but, you know, it's cool. So like I'm super pale and I am very adamant about putting my sunscreen on because one, I look weird with a tan and two, I don't want to get sunburned. So I asked this girl to help me out by putting sunscreen on my back. And I realized that I probably shouldn't have asked the girl with the really like, like the blistered sunburnt fake boobs. Like it was just painful, you know? Yeah. So she put the sunscreen on my back and I'm washing and, and I just, yeah, I mean, I got this sunburn that was just about purple and equally blistery. Oh. Right. So then, but like one of the stipulations of Sturgis is you can wear whatever you want as long as you have pasties and a G string, no nudity. So I could bartend in pasties and that was great because, you know, I just so happened to have some on hand and, you know, I'd be getting cat called when I'd be pouring these people's drinks, you know, like these gnarly bikers. And then I'd turn around and they'd be like, oh, you know? <laughs> and then it was great too, because then part of the bike wash was, you know, you had to fly a sign. So I'm standing on a street corner in downtown Sturgis with nothing but bikini bottoms and a 
you know, my pasties with a with a sign that says bike wash 20 bucks. And I see these cops across the street and I thought I was going to get in trouble. They're across the street taking pictures, you know, <laughs> and then some woman like wound up like handing me her toddler for a photo for his baby book. <laughs> you know, and it's like. I hope that that kid tracks you down on his 21st birthday. He's like, would you mind holding me again uh, so I can get this? He was more um, excited about all the motorcycles going by anyway. He looked really confused. But I guess that's kind of what toddlers do. <laughs> uh, okay, so that leads into question number two. So you go by the moniker The Alabaster Disaster. I believe there's a website with that, right? Is there a blog? Yeah, I had my blog, and then now I'm trying to put a website together. That was from my, my burlesque years. So tell me about The Alabaster Disaster. Well, I'm really pale and I have a tough time dancing. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, two other girls and I started a burlesque troupe, gosh, close to 10 years ago now, which is crazy. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. But yeah, that was bad weather burlesque. They're still performing. Um, and the other two girls, they, they've gone out on their own too. And But bad weather burlesque is still in existence. It's kind so of amazing cool. because yeah. nothing like that existed. In this area at that time, maybe uh, generations ago, there was something that I don't know about, but right. this is the thing. And it captured the attention so much that you even had to uh, argue with like the city of West Fargo over some ordinances, right? Um, Yeah, there was there was some ordinances in question, you know, as part as far as, you know, what's, you know, what what's decent, you know, <laughs> whether you can have your tops on or, you know, because you always have your pasties because. Nipples are really offensive, but if you put rhinestones on them, they're not so offensive. <laughs> it's like it's, which doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh be, my god! Yeah. There will be no unbedazzled genitalia mm-hmm. on display. <laughs> yeah. Right, you're not naked as long as you glue some rhinestones to your junk. It's cool. Right. <laughs> um. Well, in, on a previous episode of this podcast, we had Jackson Spade, okay, uh, in as a guest who for a very long time, worked as a DJ in a strip club. Okay. And the conversation that JJ and he centered around was the lack of pageantry mm-hmm. in strip clubs and stripping. Right. Is burlesque merely the addition of pageantry, or is there something that is more specific that would you, in your mind, separate a burlesque performance from just a, a stripping performance? So what's really interesting about that, I, uh, I actually danced in a topless club for a while, too, and, like... There, there is a distinct difference where, you know, like there, there is a lot of pageantry involved with burlesque and that was the predecessor to like modern, modern stripping, you know, there is that glamorama, but then there's also, um, like with, with the modern, um, dancers, they, uh, I mean, like there's still, there's still an amount of pageantry. It seems that, uh, a lot of, you know, like a lot of the, the patrons there, like they love, you know, like the most feminine parts of women, you know, they love it when they, you know, when their hair is done, when their nails are done, when, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of an interest, it's different levels of pageantry, but I mean, it's not the whole presentation, like you're not, you know, covered in rhinestones, like glitters frowned upon, you know, in a club because, you know, if somebody comes home with a bunch of body glitter on them, you know, the old lady isn't going to like that so much, you right. know? Yeah. The and, old uh, lady. <laughs> right. Yeah. I hate that term, but I had not is, <laughs> is Does a lot of it then just have to do with the context of where this is happening and what's happening? Because I've never right. seen like at a burlesque show, unless this still happens, like you do it, but at a strip club, there are people throwing dollars on stage, you know, or that kind of thing. And um, right. is like, that happening in burlesque as well? Or So there are, you know, there is tipping in burlesque, but it's more, burlesque is definitely more um, choreographed. Whereas, you know, like, um, like in a club, I mean, like there is a certain amount of choreography, but I mean, you're also pleasing your customer base and you're working for that money. And I never did lap dances or anything like that. Like where I, I was at the Oasis, which was a whole different. Which is uh, in its current scandal right now as well. So right. what's the scandal about whether or not they should be allowing dancing down there. And it's, it's, it's sort of one of those things where like, well, why, why are you getting involved in this conversation if you don't need to? And 
I think that maybe one guy went yeah. home and he was covered in glitter, if, and so it, now his wife is making him be a crusader. You know, what, if, stripping is good, if stripping is good enough for Aberdeen, South Dakota, then it should be good for Eddie Vora. God bless uh, Aberdeen. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let me tell you something. It's not like Aberdeen is a... Uh, <laughs> I've I've been to the two clubs that existed in Aberdeen at that time, and one of them was uh, horrible. I've been to the one that still exists. Man, I've never yeah. been to one of the clubs there. I did meet a girl from Aberdeen. And- Club is not the applicable word. Okay. Club is definitely not the applicable okay. word. The used to be an auto parts store. That is now that now features topless dancing. Who are you? Who are oh. traveling dancers? They're not people local. Who are not locals? Right. When I so when I was there, there are two places. One was called the Pirates Cove, which when you walked into it, had a lot of production value. The walls were made to look like rocks, like you were in a cave. What? And there was a big gold treasure chest at one end, and they had a a a a, a bird cage with canaries in it. I don't really know why, but and this I found place a, is closed. Why? I right. Uh, it was one of those places where they let production value costs just were too oh, much. Yeah. I was there with Canaries the line vendors, expensive. and they let us stay after hours, and we had so much fun there hanging out. I'm not sure Aberdeen can support more than one strip club at a time. Well, so the other strip club was a place called the Silver Dollar. That one mm. still exists. And here's what I experienced when I walked into the Silver Dollar. You walk in, and there's three high top tables, but no chairs. And this place could easily have. 20 or 30 high top tables so Mm -hmm. it's very sparse and then there's a bar and the bar is in a half moon shape and in the hollow spot from the half moon shape is an elevated stage and that's where the dancing takes places okay but the girls are also walking around to my left there is and you buy beer by the six pack so you (laughs) buy a six pack of like paps blue ribbon and then share it with your table and they give it to you in the ring so I assume so you can take it home. Usually, like in Sturgis, <laughs> you crack open the beer, right? right you know, right. not of the silver dollar. Uh, but there's a full-size vending machine to my left mm-hmm. that should hold chips and candy bars and stuff. But what is, there's only two items in here. So there's 30 of the spindles that are empty, but there's two items. One are packages of certs, and then the next one are single condoms. What? So date night. Yeah. <laughs> so we're enjoying our uh, our Everything six pack of PBR six pack condom. Search. And there was a girl, and she walked over, and one of the guys was like, "I'll give you five bucks if I can spank you." And she's like, "Okay, sure." So this guy spanks her, and then a line forms, and <laughs> p- other people want to get involved in this spanking, and then someone goes. I'll give you 10 if I can spank you with this belt. And she oh, goes, God. all right, but <laughs> this is for younger ears. Don't listen. Ear Ear muffs. Muffs. <laughs> she, goes, she goes, but don't you dare hit me in my pussy. <laughs> and so the guy takes off his own belt and whips her with the belt. And she proceeds to let maybe five, six other people whip her with a belt. Do they each pay? Some people yeah. are into that. And I thought to myself, I was like, I have, I'm going to get out of here. There's also two old ladies playing video slots at one end, too. It it was just an unfortunate place. And you've been there, too, now, huh? I've been there twice now, yeah. And was it just as bad, or yeah. have they improved it? One time there were dancers, one time there wasn't. <laughs> and the time that there were dancers, the first, there were two dancers. Um, I don't remember who told me. It wasn't the dancers because I didn't talk to them, but someone there told me that they were traveling. They were traveling dancers that mm-hmm. would go from like town to town. It's very mm-hmm. popular across the country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, the very first one was right at the door when you walk in. So like you walk in, the bouncer is right there. And then to your right, you're seeing a belly button because she was standing on like a milk crate or something like that. And she was dancing like right there, like to greet you as you came in. <laughs> and then the second one was walking up and down the bar, but she wasn't really trying. And no one was tipping them no one was paying them anything um but the place was rowdy and i went and used the restroom and while i was at the urinal a guy came in and took the urinal next to me and then started just as hard as he could punching the wall above the urinal he didn't he just over and over again and i could hear like his bones starting to like give way and i was like i'm, I'm getting out of this place so yeah. was he was Meth he peeing or just punching i didn't look down to see if he uh, was urinating mm-hmm. i assumed that that was the intention 
Um, maybe that's how he has to kickstart it, you know? It's He's like, getting a little anxiety. It's like, like a lawnmower. You know, you got to prime it and you got to rev the engine and then you can get it to start. He's got to break a knuckle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I met one girl that, uh, that used to dance, or maybe she still dances. I don't know, but her name was Divine. And, uh, and you know, a couple of my friends and I were at the O, and that was before I I decided to dance there. And she's sitting there, and, you know, and we're taking tequila shots with her. And she, you know, we, you know, she told us her name. And then my one friend is just like, Divine, that's also my favorite drag queen. And she, Divine has this really, really gravelly voice, but she was probably my age, maybe younger. Maybe, I don't know. But uh, she's like, well, I ain't no drag queen. I don't have none of that shit. <laughs> so then she starts, you know, so she, then she flashed, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, you definitely don't. You know, and then, you know, and we're taking more tequila shots. And she's like, I got a toast here. I got a toast here. Here is to the girls who wear the high shoes, who spend all your money and drink all your booze. <laughs> I ain't a virgin, but I ain't no sin. I still got the box. But cherry came in. <laughs> <laughs> that's really on the nerd and i had to write it down. i was like okay okay again but slower yeah <laughs> you need to get a tattoo that but like in latin <laughs> right. mm-hmm. yeah that would be a hell of a tattoo <laughs> that'd be a good talking point right there oh, that's uh, fantastic so so three so that was question number two see how i told you this conversation just goes forever i love it i love so, it so number three is you did some, I don't know if you still do, do you still do live modeling? You know, I haven't for a while. I've been, I've been all over the place. So it's, it's been tough to kind of commit. To knock down that schedule? Yeah, definitely. So you will pose in a state of nature mm-hmm. and art classes get a chance to work with a live model so they can see muscle tone and they can see, uh, you know, the way shadows really affect something. And it's much different than when you've got that faceless like m- model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I knew Sabrina for a year and I went to my friend Scott's house and inside Scott's house was a giant charcoal painting or not painting, but the art piece of you <laughs> from one of these classes that yeah. his mom had done. And I was like, I know that girl. And it, that must be a very unique experience. You know, it's it's interesting because I've done that for about or I did it for about 14 years, which is wild. And uh, yeah, I mean, like it is it is really funny because at, at first when I started, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I was just like, oh, man, what if I see somebody I know? And then I realized that it's a lot more awkward for the people that I know to draw me yeah. than me to see right. them because, you know, every once in a while you like, you know, because I'm trying to find something to look at and you're sitting there for because you stand up there for about 15 minutes at a time and then you get a break of course like your eyes wander because you know you're staring into space but you know every once in a while you make eye contact and it's like oh (laughs) but um (laughs) (laughs) the awkward eye because i assume they don't they're also you know this is the upper midwest so they probably don't want to make eye contact either they're probably already sweating bullets at like oh god why can't i just be drawing the banana again it's just (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's been really interesting because then people will actually you know and of course like it's a whole class full of people so then i won't know i won't know them all by name but then they'll know me by name so i'll run into them you know run into students while i'm out and about and it's like ah i know you again but um (laughs) but then it's funny too because you know like actually at the fargo theater mike g do you remember him yeah mustache mike Uh but he had a painting of me and and he was looking at me and he's looking at me. He's like, this is going to sound really weird, but I have a, I have a nude painting of you. It's like, Oh yeah, <laughs> right on. <laughs> and he's like, okay. You know, so so like it's really like, a lot weirder. He was just like, like, you'd be unaware of it. Like, wait, where did you paint that? Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. hey, were you outside my house painting me? <laughs> right. Did you come in and ask for my number? Um, <laughs> so, Walk me through the, the process. So you said you have 15 minutes and then you get a break. So what kind of a position are you getting in? Well, it, it depends too. Because I mean, like sometimes you start out with gestural poses, which are like maybe one to five minutes at a time. And, you so know. Give, tell me what like a gestural like a, pose. A gesture drawing is like a, a really quick drawing in that 
gets people kind of warmed up to like, you know, with their materials. And generally that's maybe with pencil or with, uh, with charcoal. And then, um, so it's not you gesturing to something. It's not you pointing. It's, <laughs> right. not, it's not a series of like just, Sabrina pointing at different things. See an M&A. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about that the other day. I had a dream about Sabrina once when we were at the Fargo Theater. <laughs> And I think it was from the fact that I think it was from the fact that Sabrina had posed so often and was very open about it and was the first person I met who was the exact opposite of me, meaning comfortable with their body and and like not ashamed of it or embarrassed of it. And I had a dream where we were all working at the Fargo Theater and we were all in the lobby just prepping for an event. And Sabrina walked in and said, hey, guys, hey, uh, you guys uh, want to see my vagina? <laughs> and we all went. Like, sure, like for science, why not? You know, if she's if, if she's here offering for the whole, you know, all the men and women in this room to, why not? And then so she uh, opens up her uh, clothing and it's a sea anemone. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's moving like it's underwater. <laughs> and so Sabrina in real life then started this thing where she does this like hand motion, <laughs> like down by her crotch whenever she'd see me to say hello, <laughs> to say sea C- anemone. It's like a wave. <laughs> it's like a secret handshake. <laughs> that was the end of that dream, though. We got a really good picture, though. Do you remember that? Yep, with- I still have it. It's from. <laughs> it was from a, the Halloween party where we, JJ and all of us, dressed up as Frisky Dingo characters. Oh, that was a great Halloween yeah. party. And that was the first time I kissed a man. Yep, Matt Burkholder. Mm, yep. A lot of you kissed like Matt. Matt kissed a lot of dudes that night. Yeah, but uh, he slipped me the tongue. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Like, I thought we were like, oh, we'll do this little cute, like, peck. And didn't no. we have, like, a bottle of absinthe, too? He brought, that was the one. He brought absinthe, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. man, that was a terrible his, hangover. His boyfriend had brought it from Amsterdam, I want to say, or something like that. Right. Yeah, that, that night got out of hand very fast. <laughs> but it was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, okay, okay. But I had so to just, model the next day, so there there is a little bit of a tie-in, but I had to, like, it was a double shift, like, or not a double shift, but there are two classes that I was modeling for, so that was, like, six hours of being in hot lights in front of a bunch of people, like, nude, and trying not to fall asleep, mm. and trying not to look hungover. I had to go <laughs> to Cass Public Health and get a bunch of shots for a trip to Africa the next day, <laughs> so imagine getting a malaria shot while you're hungover. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you start off and they, they do these gestural drawings. And so yep. then what happens? So then. And are know, the gestural drawings of you. So they're like, okay, we'll get the face. So those are just the, the warm ups. Right. right. And then, you know, you can be a little bit more creative with your posing or whatever. You can, you know, throw out an arm or something or, you know, like kind of. I don't know. Like you can be more flexible with your posing that way because you don't have to hold it and and sit like on your foot for like 15 minutes and then get back into position and, and go through the whole process. But, um, but then there's also, um, shorter poses. And then you, I'd always ask the teacher, um, you know, if they wanted a reclining pose, if they wanted a standing pose or seated, I was always a fan of reclining because then I could just, you know, get, sleep. Right. Those are, the, <laughs> those are, those are the sweet spots, right? You totally. know, Oh man, this is great. What is was that a pillow? You don't ever like <laughs> bring in a bunch of models and enact like a battle scene. Oh man, that'd be sweet. Like a pose battle scene of Valkyries. Would you <laughs> ever? Did you ever have any costume pieces? Did they ever put you in a big yeah. Viking helmet or something? You know, I um sometimes I'd bring my own burlesque pieces in, mm. and that would be you know that was pretty cool. Um, John Twingley was doing a um a demo one day, so I brought my le- my later hosen in. Mm, lovely, so I have lovely. A really, <laughs> I have a really great drawing from. <laughs> um, Mr. Twingley, where I'm wearing my later hosen. Um, and then also like there would be, like art rooms are really great because there's the most random shit like everywhere. Like there's bones, <laughs> there's random Eat. antiquities, there's random. Um, there's my you know there might attacking be attacking Sabrina. That's why I said the name Pete all of a sudden. Oh, Pete, he just wants He's some like, attention. I'm part of the moral majority. <laughs> <laughs> just wants some head scratchings. And. And so when you when you're doing something like this, is it hard to keep your foot from not falling asleep? Or what happens if you're just like you say like timeout, timeout? Do you get one timeout during the whole yeah. thing where you're like, I just 
guys, I got to take, I got to take a quick three. Yeah. And like, that's the thing too, is like you eventually realize like you don't want to kink your arm. You don't want to like, you know, cut off your blood supply. Otherwise your arm's going to go numb, you know? Um, or else, you know, if you have your foot in a weird way that, uh, <laughs> more for the listeners the out there, more kitty wrestling is taking place. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you definitely have to shake it out. Otherwise, you know, cause I would spend my breaks walking around and looking at the the students' artwork, and it was really interesting watching their work progress. Because at the beginning, like I'm really tall, I'm like six feet tall, so I'm like unnaturally long. So people would, you know, kind of like, you know, squish me down, and I, you know, I kind of look like, well, do I need to eat better? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just one of those things where they're getting used to the proportions. But uh, but then they'd also get really nervous too, and they'd be like, I'm I'm sorry. It's like, well, you don't be sorry. You're learning. <laughs> <laughs> you what know. so you got to see everybody's art? Yeah. And so, then it was like, oh, okay. Uh do they outfit you with a, a robe of some kind? I mean, what well, what's the what's the process there? Well, see, I used to like MSU, I used I started out at MSU and they would always have a robe that you could that you could borrow. And you know, and I thought that was a pretty good deal for a while. And then eventually like I put it on and then I caught a whiff of whoever mm. else had been wearing it. I didn't know if it was like washed at all, but I mean, and then I realized that it's like, oh yeah, I'm not the only one wearing this. There's somebody else that's been sitting in this in the nude, you know? So then I started to bring my own robe and that's, that's the best way to go. And there were times that I would forget it. So then I'd end up walking around in my, you know, in my winter jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so pro tip, if you're going to get into this, Bring your own robe. Have a nice soft robe, Mm -hmm. but not too nice because you'll end up with paint and charcoal and tape and all that, Mm -hmm. all that jazz. People doing a lot of tape drawings of you, like (laughs) just small pieces of scotch tape uh, arranged to look like Sabrina. Like the Pee Wee Herman thing. Like I'll just. All right. This series is called Pig Nose. (laughs) Pig Nose. All right. So let's, I was going to wait for that as the last question, but we'll go into this one. So why are people so repressed about nudity? What's the deal, huh? I don't know. Everybody's nude under their clothes. I mean, I don't know if it's. That's a a really good question. Are you familiar with the free the nipple campaign? Yeah. So uh, Britta uh, Nelson, who's been a guest on our podcast. It was episode number two. Uh, Four. So listen to episode number two and then (laughs) listen to episode number four, which is Britta's episode. (laughs) Uh, but Britta signed up for this thing called free the nipple. And I was like, well, what's that? And so there's a documentary about it, but it's the hypocrisy of the reason why I could. So I've got a good set of man boobs on me right now, but I could walk down the street without a top on no sweat. But if Sabrina walked down the street in the same state that I was, she could be arrested. She could be, uh, charged as a sexual predator. Mm-hmm. And it's ridiculous. Now there are states and cities that that uphold like, well, if a guy can walk around topless, a girl can walk around topless. New York mm-hmm. City being one of them. Interesting. So this free the nipple movement get huge masses of people, not just women, but men and women together to walk around topless, and they'll come in and they'll try and arrest the women. There was a whole thing on Instagram too, where Instagram will not allow female nipples to be shown but they will allow male nipples to be shown and so people what they would do is they would take um a close-up of nipples and be like facebook which which nipple is this is this a male nipple or is this a female nipple Mm. and they and they wouldn't they would they they weren't able to like handle that so like if you uh an artist that i follow matt kish uh he does a lot of uh art based off of nude modeling Mm-hmm. And he'll post some of the nudes, but they will have little bars just over the nipple, like just obscuring it enough so that you know f- uh, Instagram and Facebook are happy that that so no one's gonna see them dirty nips. Damn dirty nips! <laughs> Damn dirty well, nips! And you mentioned earlier it's it's just stupid why right. you could you ha- you could have a pasty and mm-hmm. my understanding is just you could have a pasty that is. Uh, a photograph of your nipple, but you need to be wearing something over your nipple. So you could create right. something that looks like you are completely topless, but right. you got to have it on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really interesting too. Like when I was, uh, so there was a time that I was doing burlesque 
dancing topless and modeling nude like all at the same time and i feel like i could have written like a like some kind of a dissertation on like the social implications of nudity mm-hmm. because i mean because actually it's all, i wish you would do that because that's right? i would read that it sounds it amazing was, and i wish that i would have um you know kept a journal at that time because i mean like you know with burlesque it's you know it's it's accepted i mean like you'd go to your show and like you would see like a wide variety of audience. Like there would be, there would be mostly women in the crowd because they enjoy the pageantry. It's very pro pro woman, you Mm -hmm. know, like, Mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's just one of those treat yourself, whatever you go to a club and, uh, and from like a dancing girl perspective, like the women were the ones that you kind of had to watch out for because they thought that I was trying to steal their man or whatever. And it's just like, Oh honey, you know, (laughs) no, (laughs) you can have him. Exactly. But honey, I think that stripper really liked me. (laughs) But I mean, it, it would just be, yeah, it was just like, it was such a weird turn of events too. And a lot of times, um, like the way that people would treat you there, like they would treat you like you were, you know, like you're just a moron, you know, like, cause I remember, um, cause you would have to play your own music from, from the jukebox. It was a real classy joint, Ooh, you know, nice. wow. so you'd have to put your dollars in the jukebox and like put your songs in and be like, how many Roy Clark tunes are on here? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, I did dance to some real haggard. The old men, old men oh, love me. I bet you they, <laughs> that is that is the pageantry I'm talking about. <laughs> right. You know? One of my fa- one of my favorite moments. There's a, there's a few of them. One of my favorite moments. Like I had my old man fan club. And they'd sit at the edge of the bar and play cards. You know, and like most of the time they'd try to ignore girls or whatever. But then I'd come up and I'd you know I'd drink whiskey with them and play cards with them and you know play some old country tunes and. It was one of their birthdays, and they're sitting at the end of the bar, and they're, uh, well, I guess there's a little bit more of a premise to, or preface to the story. There, One guy came up to me and told me that if that he would be my agent. He knew a way. He knew the secret that I could make <laughs> so much money. Yes. And he's like, you know, when you're, uh, yeah. when you're buying property, you know what you need. <laughs> you look for landscape, right? He's like, you got to have some bush, man. You got to have some bush. You got to have some foliage. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, you got to flash the bush. That's how you got to, you know, that's what these guys want to see. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, and like the way that, the way that you would get tipped (laughs) is so that place only had a cabaret license, right? So there was no lap dances, nothing like that. And you had to be six feet away from your patron and you were on an elevated stage. And it's essentially like if you'd go to the Bismarck, if the Bismarck mm-hmm. was, had dancing girls, that's it, you know? And uh, so it's people, real classy. Very classy. So people would have to throw dollars at you. They'd roll them up in balls or else they would play basketball. <laughs> so you had to <laughs> hold out your underwear and they would try to make a basket, right? Oh. Or else they did butt darts, which chapstick still... You know, it has kind of a bad smell to it to my to this day. But I mean chapstick? chapstick. Okay, so what they would do is they would take a dollar and then put a quarter in it and roll it up, right? So it's like a little dart. Uh-huh. And there would be chapstick behind the bar. And they would put the chapstick on the flat part of the dart and then try to Oh. You know, like make it stick to your butt or your back. Mm-hmm. That you know? sounds like it would hurt. Well if they're chucking a coin at you. You know, it wasn't so, it wasn't it's too bad. A, it, yeah, it's not like a third grader chucking a coin at you. This person is trying to garner your attention. <laughs> right. So that's, and if there's any way to get a girl's attention, how is that just different the, than why a third grader chucks a coin at someone? <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> one it's of them, because they can grow alone. Because they can grow facial hair. <laughs> one of them is for milk. I won't tell you which. You'll have to figure that out on your own, children. In a dirty glass. <laughs> 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 but there was this old man fan club, and, uh, and it was one of their birthdays and, you know, and they're sitting there and they're having a good time and I'm giving them a hard time or whatever. And then all of a sudden they had this cheer, bush, 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 bush. And then there's one guy and he sits there and he's like, and we ain't talking about the bear. Oh boy. <laughs> These guys have been working on some pretty stellar lines. Huh? I know, man. They're still my favorites though. <laughs> I I would be interested if you wrote something though because those it's the same exact uh, what baseline but three drastically different stories right. revolving all around the same thing. Well, and then there's another moment where I was doing this. I was modeling nude for an art class, right? And there would be times that you'd be modeling with another with another model, and the you know the the teacher 
told me is like, well, she can't get a babysitter for her five year old. So she's going to bring her her five year old in. And I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then I started thinking, it's just like, oh, man, this poor kid, like she's going to see her mother modeling with another woman nude in front of a room full of people like that's gonna that's that's really gonna mess with her you know but then I got to the class and like you know there were a bunch of like she brought some books she brought some games and she was totally engaged and well disengaged with you know what was going on and it wasn't you know it wasn't a big deal we were just standing there for in an educational environment and just sitting there natural and there was nothing nothing sexualized about it, nothing dirty, like nothing morally wrong about the situation. But I mean, I think it's a matter of how we're brought up to perceive ourselves and to perceive our bodies. Like we shouldn't think that think of them as sexual vessels and sexualize everything about nudity, everything about flesh. I think it's just a matter of teaching people to be comfortable in their skin. And that is, so that is exactly where I think we need to get to be because so much body shaming goes on mm. even before you take off the first layer of clothing. We, so. we too, I mean, obviously this has been said over and over again, but if a, in a movie, a bunch of people's heads are getting cut off and blown up and shot, and then it's rated R, but if there's a sex scene where two people are 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 showing love to each other, then it gets to be NC-17 up to a certain level. And it's like, what is it about you know, I've known so many people who are parents with no issue with their kids watching horror films and gory stuff and violence and all sorts of weird stuff. But once it comes to nudity, they, they suddenly have to be shielded from it. And right. I think that's the thing that's perpetuating the most of it is we all get raised. You're never you're, like the parent is never protecting the child. It seems they're protecting their own sense of right. what the child's innocence is defined by. And we can't right. sully my child by letting them see Janet Jackson's nipple during an NFL halftime show. Well, and I think naturally we want to be naked. Uh, how many kids do you know who, you know, they're thinking like, well, you know, Tommy runs around naked. He's just, he's a naked kid. He's a baby who loves to be naked. I think it seems odd for people to want to wear clothing. And so mm -hmm. just embrace it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. When I was in high school, I went on a trip to Italy and France with my French class, and it was comprised of kids from Mississippi, kids from uh, no Fargo North and Fargo South High, and then I think another group from like Tennessee. And we had a wonderful trip, and on one of the days of the trip, we found out there was a nude beach nearby. And so myself and three other people were like, we're going to go to this nude beach, and we're going to see some naked people. <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. So we get to this nude beach. The nude beach is all comprised of old men, who have just enormous tally whackers. It was insane. And people of the shapes and size who would have come over for a dinner party with Look my at parents. The dicks on these guys. <laughs> my God. It was, it was it was impressive. Like little like third legs is what I would call them. And that's the thing is you don't you don't go to a nude beach and find all it's all these drop dead amazing you know, I wasn't seeing Cindy Crawford everywhere when I was there. And that's the thing is Everybody is naked at some point during the day. So just embrace so it, basically man. Basically, nude beach is like a YMCA men's uh, bathroom, changing yes. room. You and I have had room. that same experience in the yeah. YMCA bathroom. I'm of a generation that's very ashamed of my privies and would like to like to keep them covered up while I eat my Taco Bell. It, it's weird because I, I do feel that... <laughs> I always eat Taco Bell clothes. Sorry. You know, do you sleep <laughs> naked or do you wear something to the bed? Uh, usually there's underpants. Really? I sleep buck naked. If there's a fire in my house, my neighbors are seeing everything. <laughs> uh, I hate sharing a hotel room with other people because it means I'm going to have to wear PJ pants and uh, like a tank top. I hate that. like to just let it go, which means that I wash my sheets three, four times a week. We're definitely at that age now where if you're going to travel somewhere with some friends, if one friend goes, hey, you know what we could save on cost by sharing a hotel room? And the rest of you go, what's this wrong with you? No, you should have enough money for your own hotel room at this point. And no, I'm not sharing with you. Why would I want to do that? Did you bring snacks for the flight? Did you cut up? Are those grapes? Uh, so, so, okay. Let's keep progressing with the story of Sabrina a little bit, a little bit here. Um, we, the three of us shared a, a pretty epic road trip to Chicago. I was just thinking of that. Yeah. One time. 
where we dropped you off in Chicago and then mm-hmm. Tucker and I continued on through Indiana, which has the most billboards for fireworks than any other state <laughs> uh, and into Kentucky to visit his grandmother. But I, I don't even remember how that it started where the th- three of us ended up. Obviously, you were you wanted to visit your grandma. We were going out there. Uh, Sabrina's boyfriend at the time was living in Chicago. And so oh, that's and it so was. it was it's like a ride share because we knew we were going to at least spend the night in Chicago. And so I think we dropped off Sabrina and yeah, then we went our, went on our merry way. Was that the trip? Did you break up with him? Did you guys like call I think it, it was. quits? I think that and was so that So we trip. picked you up. It couldn't have been any, like if you had to spend <laughs> 10 more minutes, it'd be like, thank God you guys got here when you got here. <laughs> I remember tears and embracing happening. Yeah. <laughs> from, you know, us. <laughs> from us. And at that time, I believe I believe he was living across the street from a store I wanted to go into that sold used hotel furniture. <laughs> and you could buy a couch for nine bucks. And it, because they pulled it out of some old hotel that was getting an upgrade. And that place was amazing. It's too bad JJ wasn't with us when we went to Valley City that one night. <laughs> that was a lot of fun too. Was that was Sam. so much fun. And was it Satan? No. So you meet Sam and Saban? Jonas. Was it Jonas? I think I thought there was only three of us. I thought I think it was you, me, and Sam because then we met okay. your friend out there too. Yeah, Sabrina mm-hmm. is absolutely the perfect person to go on a r- crazy last minute road trip. <laughs> right to be like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we went to oh. blank? Yes, it would. Let's go. The yes, and then uh, was we were going up, running up Pioneer Hill, and then the cops wound up coming, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, because we we went <laughs> we to that we went, in the grass. we went to the bar. <laughs> And then got a bunch of PBR to go. <laughs> and then we went, yeah, we were drinking in that park. And then like the one cop on duty showed up and showed us flashlight. So we ran to the other side. And I think that's all he really intended to do was like, just go drink at home, kids. Don't drink at this. Don't drink at this park. Oh, God, that was so much fun. I love a good memory from my youth, but I will be the first person to admit that I have now gotten to a point of where I'm too old to do some stuff. I feel like my my twenties are long gone at this point, and so I'm not doing things that are as exciting anymore. So a last minute like let's go to Valley City and party would involve me going. Well, I gotta go home and I gotta I gotta grab you know this and I should let the dogs out and uh, you know actually I I gotta I gotta think about doing my taxes. Sorry guys, I'm I'm out. I'm out. Count Something me out. about your own bed. <laughs> there is something beautiful about my own bed. Oh, I love my own bed. Man, I've been uh I'm always naked in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been bartending in Robinson, North Dakota on occasion. Mm. I've been spending a lot that might be the new new Ypsilanti. Really? So uh you might so my friend Bill Bender wound up making some headlines a couple of I guess it's maybe almost two years ago, year and a half ago. But he wound up taking the trademark from oh. ru- or from rugby for the geographical center mm-hmm. of North America. That's right. That's right. <laughs> to which they are pissed. <laughs> yeah, they are. But then everybody's coming out of the woodwork like, well, I could be the geographical center too. Or how about me too? Well, there was this. So rugby's dirty little secret is being revealed. <laughs> and it took Bill Bender to do it. <laughs> I can't believe that they let the copyright on that For lapse. so long. It seems like it's a, a a simple little thing to go like, you know what? We we pride ourselves on being the geographical center. We should probably keep this thing under lock and key. We should probably have this put together and ready to go. Right. Like, why isn't that in the meeting minutes? Like, okay, how's the trademark doing? This is our, this is our identity. Right. Exactly. Like, we're banking on this. This is like our whole, this is our shit. And so I think that they were going to trademark the real geographical center of North America. I, there's, Dude. there's a lot of and talk when, going when on. And when you include the word the real, that's when you know they fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the real. You, you always think about that with Twitter accounts nowadays, too. So if it's uh, at real Janet Jackson, you know, like, oh, Janet, you didn't catch on. To, you know, you didn't. Where's your PR people? They didn't think Twitter was going to become a thing. <laughs> right. Shouldn't you immediately, no matter what it is, whether it takes off or not, lock that down, <laughs> that right. opportunity? Um, there's somebody who has, who put together like a Twitter handle 
uh, for a radio station in Sioux Falls. And unfortunately, they registered my email address because we ha- we have similar email addresses. And so I could get into that person's Twitter account at any time. I'm not going to because I don't care enough. Mm-hmm. But once a month, Twitter says, hey, JJ, confirm your account, your Twitter account. I'm like, no, thank you. Not interested. Don't know no- enough about Sioux Falls. Other than you have a Cracker Barrel and an Outback Steakhouse. Ooh. Yeah, two of my favorite places. Wow. Yeah. Those are chain restaurants, but I'm all right with it. It's okay. It's I mean, okay. do you ever hear anybody speak poorly about the Outback Steakhouse? No, no. I, I don't think many people talk about it. Because people don't say anything <laughs> poor about Australia in general. Makes sense. Right? They know yeah, better. Have you heard people say like, oh, Australia, the place is a piece of shit. I'd never go to Australia. No, you say Australia, and then inevitably someone's like, that's not a knife. That's a knife. Uh, Foster's, Australian for right. beer. Koala and everybody's bears. hot. Everyone is hot down it's there. Like Norway. It's not. It's crazy. It's not fair. Yeah, I kind of want to go there just to even things out a little bit for the rest <laughs> of the country. I got totally suckered in by that uh, tourism uh, viral thing that Australia just did, where they made it look like there was a new oh. Crocodile Dundee movie coming yeah. out, but that it was going to be starring um, Danny McBride. Yep. And I... I thought it was real. And I, I was, was like, this is, about it. I thought this is a brilliant way to bring it back that he has a son, but his son is nothing like him. Because and, you right. know, that's the premise of Crocodile Dundee three is that he has a baby and he's oh. in LA. So they've all, the Crocodile Dundee series has already set this up to be a winner. I, I so <laughs> want that movie to be made now. I would watch that movie. I would totally watch that more than I, I would ever go to Australia. I don't care for Danny <laughs> McBride. Really? I'm just not a Danny McBride fan. Hmm. What are you gonna do? Is he like mustard, basically? No, I just, I just don't find him to be as funny as everyone does. Occasionally, he'll have something that really. I thought Eastbound and Down was a great series, and I really enjoyed it. But most of the movies he's in, I saw Your Highness, his pot smoking, uh, Arthurian legend movie, and that thing was crap, start to finish. Poor Natalie Portman is in it. <laughs> Really? Uh, oh, it's so bad. It is so, so bad. And there's a part where she goes for like a swim and she's wearing a, a leather skirt and they CG'd it so that it looks like she's wearing a leather thong instead. And apparently when she saw the movie, she was like, uh, oh, what? Whoa. <laughs> Excuse me? But she had just recently completed her role as Queen Amidala, so... <laughs> JJ, I just had a realization that's connected to early part of our conversation. It's for some new JJ Meets World swag. We need some JJ Meets World pasties. Ooh. Yeah. Our, our our logo is a circle. It's actually perfect for a pasty. Mm. So, Sabrina, it's... next time you are ever doing burlesque, how, much would, it, face? how much would it cost yep. to get some JJ Meets World? How much would it cost us to get some JJ Meets World pasties on there? Let me see. We'll, we'll work I'll something to, out. We'll Wait, work so something you, out. Want, you want to rent her nipples? <laughs> I wanna, that, that's what it sounds like. Well, if, if if she is willing to wear your face on her nips, then I think she should get something out of it too, right? I mean, that's like uh, it's like a NASCAR, you know. <laughs> it's like getting a bunch of logos on your car. This is the new. I love this. This is the new. This is the new revenue stream. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't want to. I don't. Here's the thing. The second that I have to pay for real estate on another person's body <laughs> is the moment where I'm like, ooh, I should have just bought another billboard. Well, you know, there's you have a couple of different options, really. I mean, like you can do pasties, and then there's also a thing called assles. What? what? Assles. Oh, please so talk. They- <laughs> please talk about whatever this is. So they're, they're tassels that you put on your butt cheeks because, you know, you can, you can twirl your tassels on your, you know, for your... On your bosom or whatever, but then there's a certain move you can do where you can twirl tassels on your butt cheeks. I thought this. I thought you were saying it's like a pasty for your bee hole. No, I thought that's <laughs> what it was. Here's the thing. That's kind so, of what I want it to be. <laughs> well, you know, people might do that. People are into a lot of different things. I'm guessing if a city doesn't want you to show your nip, they don't want you to show your bee hole as well. <laughs> And what better way to cover it? After a quick Googling of custom pasties, they run ten to twelve dollars. But here's the thing. Here's here's where the real twenty rub, bucks. Twenty four bucks. Here's where the rub I think it's for a pair. Oh. Okay. I think it's twelve bucks for a pair. Nice. But 
you need to specify the size. Mm. So they come from two inches to five inches. My guess is Sabrina knows the specs. Like, mm-hmm. like do you, do, nipple are, specs. Do, do pasties normally come in sizes or is it well, one size nipples, fit all? All nipples come in different sizes. Right. Is there in any legislation that 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 shames you into covering your nipple? Does it specify like a certain amount of nipple at the very least? Like it has to be at least 70% covered? It has to be 100% covered? Can there be a little areola that is seen on the side? Yeah, you're not supposed to see areola. I don't know if there's any specifications how much you have to have covered of your your bosom. Because some de- so, some some nipples have like no demarcation mark really between. Right. Like it's really difficult to figure out where the boundaries of that nipple is. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So I mean, do you just have to wear like larger pasties? That's a good question. Because I know, um, yeah, I've I've seen pasties that cover like the majority of a of a breast. And then there's also some like really cute little tiny ones too. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. a good question. I don't know. That we'll we'll do we'll do some digging. That's no. we should have asked previous guest Rachel Hoffman. Yeah. Uh, the, the our legal about legalese. In fact, I asked her, I was like, would you be the official counsel for JJ the Meets World? Lawyer? And she said no. <laughs> she she does she thinks we're at one point we're gonna get into such serious trouble Aww. doing something that she doesn't wanna <laughs> attach her horse <laughs> to that wagon. But it's just it's the way she is. Um Sabrina, thank you so much for coming on JJ Meets World. This has been a blast. It has been a blast. Would you uh, send us some stuff at some point to tell us about how things are going with your grant process and yeah, everything like that? Definitely. If people want to see some of your work, where can they find you on mm-hmm. the internet that you don't trust? On the internet that I don't trust. See, I only put the stuff that I trust on the internet. Mm. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. No, that doesn't really make any sense. But um, I do have a website. I guess they could probably search my name. I don't have a domain name yet for my uh, for my Wix site. Got it. So it's like but, a longer Wix URL right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have uh, the Alabaster Disaster, like a Facebook page. I do Instagram under Sabrina Horning. That's probably where I post most of my stuff. That's like my new, my favorite social media platform because there's a lot less bitching on it. It's JJ pictures. Meets World is also on Instagram. You should follow Ooh. us, please. I'll do it. We should take an Instagram photo before <gasps> you leave. Yes, we should. We'll mm-hmm. do that right it'll away. So, there'll be so many layers to this thing. So many layers. Next time you're on, we'll get into Baggies and Pam. We'll save that for another yeah. episode. I think we sh- I will, we'll Skype him in and <gasps> not tell him what we're doing and just make him tell us. Because he's probably told the story of why he's called Baggies and Pam maybe a hundred times. I actually had a connection with it to the Fargo Theater, though, as well. Because I had to lie to Margie Bailey about why we called him Baggies. <laughs> really? Yeah. Did you think it was a drug related thing? No, she just said, why? Because that's what I thought of. She first. said, why do they call him Baggies? And I said, uh, it was because uh, he was walking down the street one time and I saw him and it was raining out. And so he'd covered his feet in plastic bags. <laughs> That was the lie that I came up with, like right off the t- off the top. You're a horrible the liar. Best. She bought it. <laughs> Margie Bailey bought my lie. Hook and sinker. Of course, she, of course sinker. she did. God. Of course she did. But that's a horrible lie. God. That's all I could come up with. Do you remember when the um, circus parade came through and the elephant lady, like Will, was obsessed with the, the elephant lady? <laughs> no. Like he thought that she was like way hot, and then Margie just didn't get it. She was just like, he just has the weirdest tastes. <laughs> I remember when we had a, a wife an open Wi-Fi at the Fargo Theater, <laughs> That's right. and somebody had sent to our printer, which was connected to the Wi-Fi, some very disturbing, very graphic images. And Margie was the one who found them the next morning, and she I, she was upset by it. I, I mean, as you would be, because yeah. they were incredibly graphic. Yeah. And then it was a matter of which one of you did it, mm. uh, accusing us, and it was like, no, no, no this is an open Wi-Fi. People across the street have been using the Fargo Theater's Wi-Fi yeah. for years. This was before businesses really thought about that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. About locking that down. <laughs> All right. That's it. We're done. Right. It happened. JJ Meets World. Well, this show is wrapped up like a mummy. For more info, including how you can help us keep the lights on by donating to our Patreon Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or you can hit us up on social media. Send us pictures. Uh, Maybe you're dressing up like us. I would love to see that. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites kids are using these days. 
And if you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. I can't guarantee this, but if you are listening to JJ Meets World at the gym, people might think that you're intelligent. Just throwing that one out there. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you're interested in booking JJ or the Linebenders for any of your corporate events, go to www.linebenders.com. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't think that socks and sandals are that bad. There are definitely worse things that we wear, like Crocs. Crocs.